Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Desire the unadulterated milk of the word like a newborn baby, that you may grow thereby. For God has given to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Jesus prayed to the Father, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. Before we open God's word together this morning, let's bow our heads together in prayer. Our Father, we're thankful that we have your word. We're thankful that we have the written word that is breathed out by you, has its source in you, and was breathed out in the process of inspiration through the writers of scripture over the centuries that we may know that it is absolute truth as you are truth, and that we have the living word, the incarnate word, the Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. And so, Father, as we look at your word of truth today, we pray that it might challenge us, that we might come to understand things that are going on in our own lives, perhaps in our own thinking, the way in which we look at the world around us, that we may recognize that our job is to be conformed to your character, be conformed to your way of thinking, be conformed to the character of Jesus Christ, And that we are not to um, conform you to our thinking. We are not to try to conform your word to our opinions. And we are not to interpret your word the way we would like it to be, but that we would uh, take the time to understand what you have taught us and how you have instructed us in your word. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Open your Bibles with me to John, I mean, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, and this morning we're going to look at Ephesians 4, 18 to 20. So we're moving ahead, and when we come to verse 20, 18 and 19 continue this description of the immoral and licentious way in which the Gentiles lived their lives and conducted their lives, and the challenge that... Paul is giving to these uh, Gentile believers that they are no longer to live like the Gentiles around them. And he spends this time describing the basic problem of the Gentiles around them, the unsaved Gentile world, and that description is in verses 18 and 19. And then he challenges them in verse 20, but you have not so learned Christ. This reminds me of Ephesians chapter 2, where we looked at uh, verse, uh, verse 4, where after describing the spiritual condition of everyone that comes into the world, that we are spiritually dead, uh, we are born spiritually dead in our trespasses and sins, And then Paul shifts at the beginning of verse 4 and says, But God, who is rich in mercy, uh, has made us alive together in Christ, even though we were dead in our trespasses and sins. So it's that same kind of uh, emphasis describing the condition of all human beings in terms of those who are Uh, spiritually dead and alienated from the life of God, verse 18, and then the consequences that has in terms of our living in the latter part, latter half of verse 19, and then the contrast, but you have not so learned Christ. So we're looking at our passage here, and today we're going to focus on understanding the last part of of verse 18 and verse 19, and then get into the contrast, and then take some time to understand uh, this, this 
description here of the fallen world, the world around us, the world that is composed of those who are spiritually dead, those who are, as the text describes, they're in the futility of their mind, uh, their understanding is darkened, they're alienated from the life of God, and so they produce their own culture, which is a culture of death. And it is not a culture of life. It is a culture of death because they are spiritually dead and they can produce nothing but that which is dead. And so we have to understand the significance of that because if we are going to follow the command to walk not as the Gentiles walk of which we are surrounded, then we have to understand the dynamics of that walk of the Gentile, of the fallen, unsaved Gentile world around us. And, of course, that correlates with what I've been teaching for many years on Romans 12, 2, where we're commanded not to be pressed into the mold of the spirit of the age, if, according to the way I translate that, not conform to the world. Well, we have to know what the world is if we're not going to be pressed into its mold. We have to know what that looks like. And it's not just a matter of externals. Uh, So often in superficial legalistic churches, you get the idea that if you, you have these list of behaviors, and if you do these things, then you're worldly, and if you don't do these things, you're not worldly. And that is not what the scripture says at all. Worldliness is a matter of how we think. And we're covering this to some degree in our Uh, study in Judges, as well as to some degree in uh, what we've been studying about overcomers in our passage in in Ephesians, the day of Christ, understanding that in relationship to the judgment seat of Christ, and what it means to be an overcomer. For most often the object of overcoming is overcoming the world. As Jesus said in John 16, 33, I have already overcome the world. And so we too are to overcome the world. We are to be overcomers. And not all believers are overcomers. And so we've been studying the details of that because there's some controversy over just exactly what that word means. So in verses 17, 18, and 19, we get a very uncomplimentary view of the thinking and the lifestyle of the unsaved world. But we have not learned Christ in that way. So there needs to be a distinction, but it's not just a superficial external distinction. It's one that is much deeper than that, one that involves a spiritual transformation after regeneration. So we came to the end of verse 18 last time and thought our way through a translation problem that is there. I'll read the verse again. Having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. And I said that there's a problem here because not, it's not a textual problem. It wasn't a copyist error, and there are some words in one manuscript and, and other words uh, in other manuscripts. It is that there's a difficulty in understanding the meaning. There's de- been debate over the meaning of this word and how it is used. And it's the word porosis. And I pointed out last time that it is translated as blindness in a number of translations, and even uh, John Calvin in his commentaries uh, translated it as blindness, and that became the foundation of a doctrine that is known as irresistible grace, built on the presupposition of uh, prior doctrine, total inability. Total inability is the T in that acronym TULIP, that summarizes Calvinistic theology. T for total inability, U for unconditional election, that God has no conditions, he just chooses who will be saved and passes over the others who will be uh, damned to eternal punishment. The L is limited atonement, that Christ only died for those who were elect. And the I is irresistible grace, that when God calls the 
unsaved unbeliever, uh, he cannot resist that call. And God only calls those who are elect. And then perseverance, those who are truly saved, will persevere in their obedience to Christ until the end. So that is basically a, a quick summary of, of TULIP. And I pointed out that this is what some of the basic problems are, and we'll review that as we go through our lesson this morning. So that's the basic lexical problem, is this blind or hardened. Dr. Honer, Harold Honer, who was uh, one of my professors at Dallas Seminary was the chairman of the New Testament uh, department there for many years and lived out his career there as a um, New Testament professor there, has written an outstanding uh, commentary on Ephesians. I think it is arguably the best commentary available on Ephesians. That doesn't mean I agree with him on every point. There's nobody... Uh, out there that would necessarily write something that everybody else is going to agree with, but he does an outstanding job of covering all of the issues and explaining uh, the various uh, different uh, exegetical and theological problems. And he says regarding this word, this word that I have here, porosis, that as he explains that, he said, this word conveys the idea of callous, C-A-L-L-U-S. And you're looking at that going, that's a typo. No, that's the British spelling. And that's what you will find in a lot of the lexicons. So he says, the word conveys the idea of callous that serves as mortar, thus petrification. So that's a hardening idea. Uh, to reunite the surfaces of fractured bones. So this was in medical uh, literature in ancient Greece. Uh, it serves as mortar to reunite the surfaces of fractured bones or a pus which comes out of the bone and produces callus. In Job 1770 refers to the eyes growing dim. So that's an Old Testament passage that uses this word in that sense, translating a, a Hebrew text, but it's not found to ever relate to eyes in the New Testament. Okay, so that's important. New Testament is, is using Koine Greek, whereas the Septuagint is closer to classical Greek. So there's some word meaning changes that take place in between. Now, to understand this word callous, the concise Oxford uh, English Dictionary has three basic meanings. The first is that, that it refers to a, a thickened and hardened part of the skin or soft tissue, especially one that is caused by friction. So all of us have experienced that. We've had blisters on our feet that have, where the skin has then thickened up and hardened, and uh, over time it becomes uh, insensitive to, uh, to pain and discomfort. A second use of the word callus is the bony healing tissue, which forms around the ends of a broken bone. That's what Dr. Hona referred to in his in his explanation, and that's how it was used in the writings of uh, Hippocrates. Hippocrates is considered the father of medicine, uh, and uh, he uh, used it that way to dis this development of uh, that material in a fractured bone that would lead to the healing of the bone. And in botany, it's used to describe a hard formation of tissue, especially new tissue, that forms over a a wound. In the Old Testament, as uh, Honer pointed out, we have the verse in Job 17:7, 7, my eye has also grown dim because of sorrow. So the word, if you look it up in the Hebrew, can imply a process, not something that is instantaneous, a process of growing blind. And here that would be the idea that it has grown dim because of sorrow. And in that passage, sorrow doesn't make you blind, but as your eyes fill with tears, it clouds your vision. Uh, so that's the idea there. It doesn't talk about some constitutional uh, defect of, uh, of, of blindness. That's uh, Job 17, uh, 
uh, 7. And, and the New Testament, you take a couple of passages, Mark 3, 5, uh, Jesus looks on the, cr- on the crowd, on the Pharisees. He, um, when he had looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts. And that's that word, hardness. It refers to a, a, a callus that has formed upon their uh, soul, as it were. And in Romans 11.25, we read in the King James and New King James uh, Version, uh, it's translated as blindness, uh, lest you should be wise in your own opinion that blindness in part has happened to Israel. But in other translations, the ESV, the NET, and the NASB 95, and most others, it's translated as, as hardness. And so this is an important word to look at, and the best way to see the difference between the concept of blindness and the concept of hardness is to go to this verse. In John 12, 40, you actually have both words. And Jesus is speaking, I believe here, and um, he says, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts. And so you have both words. You have the word tuflao, which is the verb for to become blind, to be blinded. And you have the word that we're looking at, porao, which is translated hardened. You wouldn't have this word porao, po, porao meaning blind, uh, as a synonym for the other word, because it, you wouldn't say he has blinded their eyes and blinded their hearts. So there's two there's distinctions here between these these two words, and at no point in the New Testament, as I pointed out a minute ago, uh, is this word used in reference to the eyes. It's always uh, to flao or the noun for uh, being blind uh, that is used, and so this concept of hardening is related to a process. It's often associated with stubbornness, and in some places it's translated that way, and the idea of a stubborn rejection of the revelation of God. And we see that explained, that concept is explained in Romans 1.18. For in the verses that come after this, Paul explains that there is a clear witness to the existence of God in his creation. The psalmist in Psalm 19.1 said that the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Paul picks up on that theme in Romans 1.18-20 uh, to 20, and he talks about how the fact that, the, uh, the, the, that God's existence is evident to us through the heavens. It displays and we are able to see his invisible attributes and his power, and his wisdom through what he has uh, created. But uh, though this is a clear revelation of God, and that everyone, according to this passage, knows God because it is evident within them, so it's evident externally and it's evident internally, nevertheless, the response is to suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And so Romans 1.18 explains this concept that human beings know that God exists, but they choose to reject that. They suppress that truth in unrighteousness. You can't suppress something you don't know. And so that emphasizes human responsibility that this callousness that develops is the result of uh, negative volition, the rejection of God and not uh, obeying him and and trying to suppress that knowledge um, in unrighteousness. Now, one more thing needs to be developed as we look at this, and that comes at the beginning of verse 19. Verse 19 is extending the thought that is explained in verses 17 and 18. One thing I want you to note here, we'll get back to this again, but um, uh, I should point this out. There are a lot of commas here. Uh, 
For example, verse 17, this I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, comma. No comma should really be there. How do they walk? They walk in the futility of their thinking. So that comma should not be there. It separates the clauses as if they're not related. And then it says, uh, and we'll go back over this in a minute, having their understanding darkened, comma, being alienated from the life of God, comma, because of the ignorance that is in them, comma, because of the blindness of their heart. So that looks like there's four separate independent uh, phrases that are there that are describing futility of their mind, and it's not that way. So those commas are actually break up phrases and clauses that should be together. But we come to this last one, and uh, he, it's, Paul says, who being past feeling. There should not really be a comma there. The being past feeling should not be set off with commas at all um, because it's all together in the, in the Greek. So the being past feeling is the word apelgeo. Op and this is a word that means to lose all feeling. So it's somewhat redundant to the idea of callousness, but it's a different word, and so it should be translated a little differently and should be understood that way. It develops, though, this same idea of, how, of the results of this callousness, okay? So verse 18 describes, uh, actually we'll see it shows three things about the futility of their mind, and then verse 19 gives us the additional information that they are past feeling. The reason it says that is that the, the grammar of this verb is it's, it's a participle, but it's in the perfect tense, which means it's completed action. Just as Jesus said after uh, he had paid the penalty for sin on the cross, those three hours where there's darkness on Golgotha, and at the end, Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then at the end, he says, uh, it is finished. And he uses a perfect tense verb, which says it has been completed already. Okay, by that time, it's all paid in full. It's completed. It's not still being paid for. It has been completed. It's paid in full. And this would be the same kind of word that would be written at, uh, at, on the bottom of a bill of sale. So that if it's paid for, it's, it's paid in full. And it's something that is completed in the past with results that go on. So when Paul uses this word in a perfect tense, he, said, he is basically saying they are past feeling. This is a condition that has already in, that's already in existence and has already been in existence. And then it is a causal participle. So it should be translated something like, who, because they are past feeling, they, there is this uh, insensitivity there to spiritual things. It's a word that has the sense of being callous or being insensible to pain or apathetic, according to Thayer's lexicon. Uh, the perfect tense indicates its completed action. So I will translate this, who, having become callous, have then as a result. So what happens with the verb is it starts describing the results of all these things we've just studied. As a result of all of that, they've given themselves over to a certain lifestyle. And that lifestyle is described here as lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. So that last part of verse 19 describes the externals of their behavior, and verses 18 and 19 are helping us understand what the futility of the mind or the futility of thinking is. So Ephesians 4, 17, let's just walk our way through this. This is one of the most difficult grammatical sections in Ephesians. There are five different well, let me put it this way. There's five major ways that grammarians structure the thinking here. 
I've sort of combined two of them because I think the two of them are so close, but they're interrelated and interconnected, and it helps us think this through. I did a stair step because that's, that's a common way to look at it, but it doesn't work as far as I, I can see here. And, and it also breaks, it goes along with the, the there are no commas in the original. Uh, but it goes along with that breaking every one of those clauses. So the main statement that Paul makes is that Gentiles are living in the futility of their thinking, the emptiness of their thinking, because they are uh, unable to think in the way God originally designed man to think. When God created Adam and put him in the garden, there was no sin. He had a remarkable mind. He had an IQ far beyond anything we could possibly imagine. And then when God put him to sleep and took the woman from his side and created the woman, she too had an incredible IQ, far beyond anything that we would be acquainted with. And there, they had a mentality and a way of thinking that allowed them to think as God thought, as God taught them to think. And we've covered this before, is that God sort of formats their thinking by talking to them and teaching them there in the garden. We learn later in Genesis 3, he would make a statement that he uh, normally would come every day and spend time with them, teaching them about his glorious creation. And so they had a wonderful mind, and it could achieve what God intended it to do in terms of its comprehension and in terms of its uh, capabilities. But because of sin, there's a distortion that occurs in human thinking. This relates to the phrase I didn't talk much about the last time, not total inability, but total depravity. Total depravity means every part of our makeup, our emotions, our mentality, our volition, every part of our uh, being is corrupted by sin. And just think about if you say, no, it's not, it's not corrupted by sin, can you do today what you did 20 years ago? Probably not. That's the corruption of sin on our body. But it affects our thinking as well. So their thinking is distorted. So then Paul's going to explain what that means in the next, uh, next phrases. And so the causal statement that is there uh, in verse uh, 18, that's a causal participle, so I'm translating it that way, because their understanding has already been darkened because they were already alienated from the life of God. So in your translation, you have a comma between darkened and being alienated, and that comma should not be there. It's not two different things. There's a correlation between the two. He, he's describing the futility of their thinking, and why is it futile? Because their understanding has already been darkened. From, the, from their inception because of sin. Their uh, understanding has already been darkened. Well, why has it already been darkened? Because they were already alienated from the life of God because of spiritual death. Okay, th th those two participles link together. That's what's important about being able to understand the original languages, and, those are, and that's one way of expressing cause. But there's another way to express causation, and that's through a causal preposition, dia. And that's what's used um, in the next line. But before I get there, I wanted to add this. In 1 Corinthians 2.14, Paul writes, but the soulish, the sukikos, or the, the soulish believer, sukikos from the word suke, meaning soul, it's usually translated the natural man, but that misses the point of that word. And it's a contrast in 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 16 between the sukikos, or the soulish man who is unsaved, and the pneumatikos, pneuma meaning spiritual, spirit. Uh, pneumatikos means the spiritual man. So in verse 14, Paul says, but the soulish man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, 
And that, in context, all through, from verse 9 on, in that passage, uh, Paul is talking about the things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard, the things which have not entered into the thinking of man. The things is a term for the revelation, the content of revelation in the Old Testament. And so they're not, the unsaved or the soulish person does not understand the things of the Spirit of God, that which he's revealed in Scripture, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Now, he can know them at, at one level, but he doesn't know them in the sense that a believer does when he accepts them by faith. So, so he is uh, talking about that, that, that this ultimate knowledge in a spiritual sense is obscured because of spiritual death and not having a human spirit. It's spiritually discerned, so that's referring to the human spirit. But that doesn't mean that they can't respond to God's revelation in his, the, the nonverbal revelation of general revelation or the verbal revelation in Scripture. That's what we pointed out last time, is that in this doctrine of irresistible grace, that the unbeliever has no capacity whatsoever to respond to anything unless uh, God draws him by an ir irresistible act of the Holy Spirit. We have two passages that I looked at last time. John 6, 45, uh, after the passage that says that no one can come unless the Father draws him. How does the Father draw him? The next verse is usually never mentioned. In verse 45, Jesus went on to say, It is written in the prophets, quote, And they shall all be taught by God. Now that's a reference to the future teaching of children in the millennial kingdom. But it has application because Jesus then applies it to the situation and says, Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. When did they hear and learn from the Father? When they heard the scriptures, when they read the scriptures. And so the way in which the Father draws them is through his written word. So when you hear the word of God, it is your opportunity to respond. You are being drawn to God. Everyone who hears the word is being drawn to God by the word. In addition to that, Jesus said in John 12, 32, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth will draw all peoples to myself. Jesus is drawing everyone to himself by virtue of the cross. So this, is, this futility of their thinking has to do with the limitations of thinking. The first reason they're futile in their thinking is that first causal participle, actually the two linked together, uh, because their understanding has already been darkened, because they were already alienated from the life of God. So spiritual death is what uh, causes their understanding uh, to be darkened. That produces uh, futility of thinking. Then you have two more causal phrases, but these are distinguished by using a causal preposition. So they don't go... The, the, the reason two and three are not under reason one. Okay, these two phrases are not uh, 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 subordinate to reason one. They are independent. So you have three basic reasons uh, that uh, express why Gentiles have futile thinking. The second is because of the ignorance that is in them. So first, it's because they're alienate, they are, their understanding is darkened because they're alienated from the life of God. The second is because of the ignorance that is in them, because they're ignorant of God's word and ig ig ignorant of God's revelation. And then the third reason is, is because of the callousness of their heart. Now, the way I like to translate that, but it's not a word we're all... Uh, we have you. It's not a word that is uh, user friendly. Is the word obdurate? Probably a word we're more familiar with is stubborn. The word obdurate, according to the um, 
a concise Oxford English Dictionary, is stubbornly refusing to change one's opinion or course of action. That probably doesn't apply to anyone here. So what this is saying is that the third reason for the futility of the thinking of the unbeliever is because of the stubbornness of his heart. That's a volitional concept. It's not his condition as born. It is his choice. He resists. He suppresses the truth in unrighteousness. He resists the revelation of God, and as a result, he becomes more and more callous to God's revelation. Now, verse 19 continues this thought with the results that come from verses 17 through 19, uh, through 19a. And that is, they give themselves over to lewdness. Lewdness may be a little too restrictive. Some describe it as lasciviousness or licentiousness. Licentiousness is better. Lasciviousness tends to be limited, uh, as lewdness does, to some sort of a, a sexual lust. But it's a much broader term than that. First of all, um, let's look at it as a, as a um, and it, grammatically, it's a perfect active causal participle, uh, who being past feeling uh, because they, who because they are past feeling, okay? So they, they are past feeling because of their uh, stubbornness at the end of verse 18, and that makes them even more calloused. And so because they are past feeling, uh, they then produce a certain lifestyle, uh, which is first described as lewdness. This is the word asogeia, and it has, uh, it's translated a number of different ways which express sort of the complexity of the ideas there, and that is, uh, it's translated as sensuality, as unbridled lust, which is usually thought to be sexual. But there's all kinds of different lusts. There's power lust. There's approbation lust. There is lust for pleasure, lust for drugs, lust for alcohol, lust for material things. There's all kinds of different lusts. Uh, unbridled lust, excess, licentiousness, lasciviousness, wantonness, outrageousness, shamelessness, and insolence. We see a lot of that kind of behavior in our nation. We see shamelessness on every corner. People have no sense of propriety anymore, and they are shameless in what they say and what they do. They are shameless in what they say when they get on social media. Somebody doesn't agree, they don't agree with somebody, and they say the most outlandish things. I, I learned pretty quick when I got onto Facebook, which I have quit getting on, um, that you would go to places, I would go to places that appeared as if they wanted to have a discussion of what the word says. But see, when you go to some of these places, uh, one of this, one was a Facebook page on Free Grace Gospel. And so you'd have people who didn't believe in it come on, but you have people who have enough knowledge of the Bible to maybe fill a thimble and there's nothing there to give them any indication that the person they're talking to has had 40 years in the pulpit and has a doctorate. And so they say the most outlandish things out of their abysmal ignorance, thinking that somehow because they've uh, heard a pastor say something one way that they know it. And, and, and people would get in arguments, and I would witness this, and I thought, no, that's not productive, that's not edifying. I'm not going to have anything to do. And most of those groups, I would say, are not productive and not edifying whatever. Um, so that goes to the next point. It, it has the idea of a lack of self-constraint. So people just get on, and, and you talk about politics or just any subject. People say the most outlandish things on social media. There's no restraint. And there's no self-discipline. There's no propriety. There's, they don't have good manners. You know, it has, you know, how can you say that as a Christian you can get on Facebook and read all that drivel, 
That's like swimming in a cesspool. So there's lack of self-restraint and it violates all bounds of what is socially access acceptable. That's, that's what this word means, asogeia. And so this is what the Gentiles have given themselves to, the unsaved Gentiles. And so Paul is telling his audience, he said, you should no longer walk in this manner. This kind of thing should not characterize your life. The next word is the word to work, which is ergasia. And this is, it, 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 it's a noun with a, with a preposition, and it means to work toward a, the, a goal, uh, to work in the direction of a goal, and the goal is described as uncleanness, a word that means impurity, sexual uncleanness in the Old Testament. Uh, it can refer to uh, spiritual uh, uncleanness or carnality, and so they are to work toward the goal of that's what they're working toward, the unbeliever, toward the goal of uncleanness with greediness. And this is the word not only for greedy for money, but it also has the idea of just plain lust for anything, not just lust for money. Scripture says a lot about this. In Ephesians 5.3, the word is used where Paul says, uh, but fornication and all uncleanness, that's the word we also see in uh, the passage we just looked at in verse 19, all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be even, uh, I would translate this, let it not even be mentioned among you, as it's, it's not fitting for saints, that is for believers. Colossians 3.5 says, therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, in other words, separate yourself uh, from those who live these, this kind of licentious lifestyle that would include fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is defined as idolatry. Now, not too many people in a materialistic culture understand that materialism is a form of idolatry. But that's what the scripture says. 2 Peter 2.14 uses the word and said, having eyes full of adultery and they cannot cease from sin, entice unstable souls. They have a heart trained in covetous practices. So this refers to leaders who are taking advantage of those in their care or those who come to them. And so they are taking advantage of them to get their money and probably for other purposes as well. And then we come to the contrast. And the contrast is, but you have not so learned Christ. And the way I would translate this is, but indeed, you have heard him, uh, excuse me, but you have, not, um, you have not learned Christ in such a way. And that shows, again, that he is describing this contrast between the lifestyle, the thinking of a Gentile and an unsaved Gentile and the lifestyle and the thinking that should characterize the believer. Now, when we get into the next verses, 21 and following, uh, we're going to get into more of these details. But we have to stop a minute. We'll come back to this next time and point out that the contrast is between in this ancient world between those that are characterized by immorality and licentiousness and antinomianism, a word that means against all law or all standards, uh, and those who have the standards of the word of God. And I want to take a little bit of time talking about this because we live in a time when we are seeing our culture by that I mean Western civilization uh, coming apart at the seams because there's no longer a moral foundation because there's no longer a spiritual foundation. And we have to understand what the consequences are, and that's what Paul talks about here. He talks about the realities of the condition of the unbeliever in terms of his thinking, which leads to his actions. But what are the consequences of a culture that is ruled by moral relativism? What, happens, what has happened in history 
to civilizations and cultures and nations that have given themselves over to moral relativism. We see the picture of that in our study on Tuesday night in the book of Judges, where everyone did the time period in Israel's history when everyone did what was right in their own eyes, when every person becomes the ultimate standard for what is right and what is wrong, then you have a serious problem. And I want to talk a little bit about that uh, next time. I have about three pages I wanted to get to this morning, but I don't think I'll have your concentration if I go through these. But it is important to understand how words and ideas have changed over the last 150 years to produce what we see around us. And it is something that, especially if your parents or grandparents, if you're involved with the teaching and training of your children, if they're in public schools or if they're even in church schools, because churches are not immune for having been impacted by a lot of these things, then uh, I really challenge you to read. There's some excellent things that are out there that have produced good analysis of what has happened and how this has come about. A lot of people just awakened to this. They didn't get woke. They awakened to this uh, just during the pandemic. And they awakened to the fact that the government was somehow out of control and schools were out of control and businesses became out of control in the way they were seeking to uh, dominate the decisions of, of people. What in the world happened to our culture? And this is not something new. It's happened previously. This is part of the trends of history in a fallen world. So we need to discuss that some because we need to understand the solution that is provided and the role of the believer in, in, in this situation, which is what is described in the remainder of this chapter. So we'll come back to that uh, next time with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, we thank you so much for what we have learned in this study, how totally, how, how totally disrupted the human being is as a result of sin, how the corruption of sin has impacted every aspect of our being, and that rather than being obedient creatures, we are disobedient, rebellious creatures seeking only our own desires and hostile to you. Father, we pray that we might come to understand from this of your grace that you could have just destroyed us all in a nanosecond, but instead you loved us in such a way that you set out a plan of salvation announced from the very beginning of Eve's sin and Adam's sin, that there would come a savior, the seed of the woman, who would defeat the seed of the serpent, and that you would provide this salvation at no cost, that anyone could come to eternal life simply by trusting in your solution and that that solution is in the person of Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. Father, we pray for anyone here, anyone listening online, anyone who is listening at a late, later date, that if they've never understood your free offer of salvation, that they would now. That all that is necessary is to trust in Christ as Savior, to believe that he died on the cross for our sins, and the result is eternal life. So, Father, we pray that as we have studied these things, that we might take to heart what Paul says in verse 20. But we have not learned Christ in this way, so that we are to walk differently. We are not to walk as the Gentiles, the unsaved Gentiles around us, but according to a new standard, a standard set forth in your word. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.